All right. Well, hello, everyone. Good morning. Uh, welcome to our first release recap of 2023. Um, I'm going to get started today. Um, now, uh, first, I'm on the main page. I just want to recap uh, before we get into the recaps where you can find the pages and the information that we're going to go over today. Um, we are going to be recording this, so we'll um, get this posted um, if you need to go back and review later. Um, and then, as always, if you do have questions along the way, let us know in the chat or feel free to pipe in and um, and ask any, any questions you may have. So I'm just on the uh, wiki homepage to start. And um, if I scroll down here, there is a section for meetings and trainings. And so you go through this page um, when you register for um, the training sessions that we have. So uh, you may have been here <laughs> before recently. Uh, but if you scroll down on this page before going to that, at the very bottom here, we have the resources for the recaps. So we have um, all of the notes for each of the sessions we did in 2022 and then 2023 um, that we'll use going forward. Now, um, what we do with these sessions, we usually do like a month retroactively. So um, it's the start of February. We're going to be doing January. Um, year end is always wild. So um, we're actually going to also be covering December 2022 as well, which that they are in the calendar year for which we're talking about. So we'll be kind of in both of these today. So let's kick it off then. Um, and we're going to kind of do by category. So I'm going to talk about USAS first, and we're going to talk about December and then January, um, just so we're not hopping around too much with the different topics. Um, so let me close out of this one. I have December pulled up here already. And for USAS, there were three regular releases in December. Now, um, some of this stuff that we'll get to had to do with the 1099s, <laughs> so um, a little bit of that is, you know, we're done with that now, but we'll just kind of briefly talk through. So um, first we have bug fixes, and uh, this very first one, we corrected um, a newly created budgeting rule. And um, we did send an email about this. So this may sound uh, familiar to you if you saw that email or if you ran into it with any of your districts. And essentially what we did is these two rules that are listed here is, is what this is related to. And um, we added these rules so that when entering a budget transaction, so a budget adjustment or an initial amount, something that would change that account's budget, it can now check and make sure the account is active. So there are certainly situations when you do want this to actually throw an error and say, hey, the account is inactive because that's the whole purpose of it. But we found that there were situations where it was happening and it shouldn't. So um, the main one that I have listed here is when trying to make an account inactive. So like if you're trying to inactivate an expenditure account, it was giving this error, even if all of the other accounts were active and then just because you're trying to inactivate it. So that was fixed with, with um, in December with this bug fix that we're talking about. Um, we're going to come back to this one because we made another update to it that happened in January. Um, but that is the um, part that happened in December. Um, we also corrected a problem preventing um, processing an account change if any of the associated accounts were negative. So some cleanup there on the um, behavior. And then this third one is the one that I really want to talk about. So I, I'm interested, this is under the bug fixes, but really I see this as uh, an improvement as well. <laughs> um, so basically what we did is we corrected the default date displayed when processing the budget adjustments. Um, and here, let me show you, I have my instance pulled up here. So we're going to go to the core and go to the accounts. And I'm just going to pick a expenditure account here. So um, I'm talking about entering the budgeting adjustments this way. If I come in and then I click on the budgeting adjustment, um, like window, and um, if the account has an initial amount, it would show in this window. 
this one, it, I don't have anything in there. We're just kind of starting from scratch. So I can kind of show you both. Um, so I would create. This pops up. It doesn't have an initial amount right now. So I could enter an initial amount here. Um, now, one part of this change we're already seeing here is this used to be grayed out. If you were trying to enter an initial amount and you were trying to enter it, um, like say later on in the year, but if you were entering it through this window, it would have it so that like you had to post initial amounts always as of 7-1. But we did hear um, from some different feedback, um, this was discussed, and um, we did hear that, you know, there are situations where they might go back and post these initial amounts later. And if they're doing it through this window, now that it doesn't have to be 7-1, they could enter a date in an open period instead of having to go back and open July in order to be able to use this posting page. So that's the first part of this change is that I could now change this date uh, to something in a current period and then post an initial. But the bigger part here is, let's put this back to 7-1 because this is what it would, so this is what it defaults to, is now when I change this to adjustment, the date up here changes to my current date. And this is something I heard, um, you know, through tickets. I know we've had some of you that um, have had some treasures that really wanted this because if they go in and enter their adjustments this way, if that was staying like, uh, you know, staying 7-1 because that's what it was on the first page and then they'd have to go type in a date, that's just a whole nother step and it depends on how many adjustments they're entering. But, you know, it's much easier if it just defaults to the current date. So. So this is what was updated with this um, with this fix. And here's our little screenshot. Um, as far as improvements, so most of these here are related. Let me see if I can, we'll do this. Um, most of these are related to 1099 updates. Um, this first section we'll talk about because this impacts like going back and looking back at the 1099 information that was generated. Um, this is specific to the file archive. So um, all of these updates were to clarify the naming convention of how the different copies show in the file archive. So um, the reference copies got a couple updates. Now they will show like if it's uh, miscellaneous, that it's a reference and then which copy of the reference. And the sealer copies show that it is like the printer sealer version. 1099 extract options is kind of the second category I made here for the um, things that were updated. And um, the PDF format output type was taken out. And that is just because um, that was kind of like a reference copy before. Now we have the official reference copies instead. So that was no longer needed. And then this last section, I'm not going to go through each one of these, but I have them here so that you can um, read through is for formatting. So, you know, we had reviewed with having those printer sealer copies um, generate that are going to be, you know, sent to the vendors, even the reference copies. Um, the team has kept tabs on with the IRS, with the um, with their documentation, what exactly was needed and how that should be formatted. And um, these are some updates related to that formatting. And then the last one I have on here for December is additional performance improvements to AP invoice processing. So the team along the way, we've been working towards improving performance. Um, that's kind of a consistent um, thing that I, um, that I know that they're working on. So this, we were looking into a situation and they found some um, they found some like optional rules that um, were causing, uh, basically they were causing it to take longer. So this update was able to be made um, related to these rules to um, help performance there when um, I think it's posting the AP invoices, um, but definitely part of that processing. And then, okay, so that's it for December. So now I'm going to go ahead and hop over to January 2023. And um, 
in January, we had two, uh, two different regular releases. And these, on both of these pages, these uh, do link, um, the version number is linked to their, um, the release uh, page that the developers um, update, that's the sent out in the emails. So if you want to dig into any more of these issues, if you have um, further things you want to look over, you can get a quick link right from there. I meant to mention that. Okay. All right. So um, on this one, bug fixes. So I mentioned that rule was going to come back. Um, we were going to talk about that a little bit more. And again, this is the rule where um, we added an error um, that would show if they're trying to post a budget transaction. So an initial or a budget adjustment is posted to an account that's inactive or has like a related account that's inactive. So the other portion of that that we had worked to fix in the first one is that when you're posting from the proposed amounts grid, at first it had like not necessarily shown an error, shown like a, an accurate error. And then we found that um, once we did the first correction, it was showing the error, but it was showing one um, account at a time, which obviously if like they're posting budgets, they're probably posting a whole lot of them. So we we um, found that happening. And so we went in and corrected that too, to make sure that this gave an error that would make sense for what they're doing. So um, what how the software works now is if you're posting from the proposed amount grid, and there are accounts that are inactive that you're trying to post a budget to, it will list out all of the accounts that are not active that you're trying to post um, a budget transaction. So you're trying to post either, um, you know, their temporary or permanent initial budget or an adjustment to an inactive account. Um, now these rules are optional. I So I, I'm not sure that this is something for everyone. Like, you know, it makes sense that I think um, certainly some districts would not want to post budget transactions to an inactive account. Um, there might be exceptions where they may need to. So that's where, you know, if these ever need to be disabled. Um, or some districts might just, you know, make accounts active and active and they still want to post budget uh, transactions, like a budget adjustment to them. So uh, let's go look at where you can find these rules just if that comes up. So system rules. And my trick for finding these is I just come over here and I use my wildcards and I type in inactive and all of these different rules that relate to inactive like accounts or vendors pop up. And these are the first two here. So, and here's what the error message says. So it's like an inactive account, but it's related to a cash appropriation or expenditure account um, need to be active and then you know, tells you what to check. So if you see an error that looks something like this, um, sorry, then uh, then it may be related to that rule. Okay. Okay, and then um, for improvements, we got one more that is related to 1099. Um, this one was related to truncating the um, ID numbers, the tax ID numbers. And basically, we just reviewed this again to make sure we had exactly the right copies here. And um, in um, looking over what they allow from IRS, basically copy B and copy co copy B or copy two, and the printer sealer copies are allowed to have the truncated um, TIN numbers. So essentially, this is the copy that the recipient is getting, that the vendor is getting. So sometimes those ID numbers are like social security numbers, right? And you might be sending those out to them in the mail. So basically it seems to me that they just allow you to be able to truncate those tax ID numbers so that any of the copies that would be sent to the vendor are allowed to have that um, version where it doesn't show their whole social security number, say, just for like um, security reasons. So that's optional, um, but if you do um, at the ITC or like have districts that are printing that use that option, we made sure that that was available um, in January.
Okay, um, let me just mention this patch real quick and then we'll go back to this last one. So we did have a patch for a specific district. This was something that um, was related to migration. There were um, old posting periods that needed updated. So that was corrected. Um, so that is what that's about. But I really want to end here with this one. So sorry for jumping around, but we're going to go to the software again. And I just want to um, wrap it up with that is an active filter has been applied to um, the account um, interface tabs. So cash, appropriation, expenditure, and revenue will display only active accounts by default. This is something we definitely had asked for. Um, we had people ask for, for for quite a bit. And so we were able to get this in there. And um, I'm really excited about this. I think this is awesome. So uh, let's go here. And I'm going to my core accounts. And so what we're looking at, so I have my cash account. Let me pull this up here. And where we're looking is right here at the top. It says show active. And so this is checkmarked. And um, you'll notice that's checkmarked by default. So it starts like that. My active column here, if I scroll through, these are all active. So now when they go through and say they like inactivate an old cash account, not only is that preventing it from being used, but it's also going to just hide it from their view, uh, you know, by default with this checkbox. Um, if I and so I switched over to expenditure grid to show you it's on all four of these. Um, but if I uncheck this, then see now I can see this um, inactive account here. So it just kind of will update um, that view by checking or unchecking it. Um, so that's just nice. You know, that's just nice if they're scrolling through and, um, you know, if you're trying to filter for something, um, you know, you it basically saves the step of having to put the T in this box to start. And then here's the revenue. Um, and again, I can just uncheck and it just reloads. I kind of like that. Um, I know with this grid, you know, a lot of, for like the main changes to the grids, it actually has like a reload the full page and so that you have to click on the tab again. So um, we're noticing that it just kind of um, updates the grid that you're on. Um, and then to appropriation. And um, the last thing to notice, so this one is still checked. So these are just showing the actives, but the revenue, I had unchecked this before I moved away. So this one is unchecked. So it does kind of work independently so that it's not like, you know, if I, if I choose to show uh, the inactives on like, you know, my cash grid, then it's going to expand my whole expenditure grid or something like that. So um, those are per grid. So anyways, I hope that makes it a little bit easier. I know some of these districts have a whole lot of accounts, so uh, that should help them narrow down. But um, yes, so that is all I have for you, SAS. Um, If you have questions, let me know in the chat, but I think we are about ready to get switched over to USPS next. Okay. Okay. Let me share my screen here. All right. Situated. All right. Good morning, everyone. We will switch gears um, and talk about the USPS releases for December um, and January. We'll start with January, or I'm sorry, December 1st. Um, we did have five um, releases. So we had three regular releases and then two hot fixes. Um, a lot of the time, um, as you, you'll be able to tell as we've, we um, go through everything this morning, was devoted to um, year-end processing. Um, so we are going to briefly touch upon those, um, you know, hot, those bug fixes and um, enhancements and so forth, but that time has passed. So um, 
we will go over them briefly and then um, you know dive deeper into those um, improvements and new features that um, you're going to be using more frequently going forward. So we'll go ahead and get started. Um, the bug fixes that happened um, in December, um, we had um, a ITC report that uh, ACH destination description um, was longer than 60 characters. Um, and that actually caused an issue when um, they were posting their payroll. So that limitation has been removed. So now, you know, it's not restricted to just 60 characters or less. Um, and you won't have, districts won't have issues when they're posting their payroll. Um, next, um, there were times and we had um, sort of struggled trying to figure out how this was happening, um, but we had reports um, that what started out as reports that retirement was not being withheld correctly. Um, and it was very, very sporadic, very rare cases. Um, and we weren't able to determine um, until it happened a couple, you know, additional times as to what truly was going on. And what was happening was on rare occasions um, when attendance was then getting um, posted into um, current, the, the system was actually creating multiple position pays. So if you would look at that pay report for that person, um, it became kind of obvious. Um, you know, if you post some sort of extra payment to a position, it should just be listed on a line within, you know, position one, position two, and so forth. It actually was creating a whole separate section um, so it would, be, it would be listed as position one and maybe their regular pay and then position one again, and then this miscellaneous payment. Um, and therefore it was causing the retirement to not be calculated correctly. And that's, you know, obviously caused further problems. So um, we were able to determine what the root of the problem was and that now has been corrected. Um, so anytime you see you know, instances where, you know, extra payments are being listed, you know, on that pay report broken out, several, you know, multiple times, that's a problem. You should always see those grouped together, you know, one section listed per position. Okay. Um, next, we um, corrected um, a case, case, I think, enhancements that were made um, to the HSA submissions actually caused um, payroll um, adjust or payables adjustments, I'm sorry, they had no payment attached to them to be pulled into that HSA submission. Um, and therefore the HSA um, total was incorrect. So we had reports where, you know, this employee has had $150 deposited in their HSA and now all of a sudden, you know, it's $250. So um, we were able to get that um, fixed. So now those HSA submission files should be the for the correct total um, and no problems going forward. We also corrected an issue with um, refund of, and I see I caught, still catch myself sometimes using old terms. Um, it should be refund of a payroll item, not deductions. Um, are, we're not correctly including the employer pickup adjustments on the earnings register. So we've corrected that. So those will be correctly reported um, as one would expect. And then lastly, um, we had a case where um, a district reported that they initialized their payroll. Everything was green. Um, you know, the everything was good to go. Um, but when they went to open their payroll air report, um, it wouldn't open and it produced a severe error. Um, so they were kind of stuck. Um, so when our developers looked into it, um, it, it was determined that an employee number had been changed, um, you know, in the middle of the process, payroll process. So that's what, what the um, problem was. So we've now corrected that. So if there is a change in an employee number in the middle of a payroll process like that, the correct number will be listed on the, re the air report and um, the air will, will not be produced. Okay, um, moving on to the improvements. 
Um, again, um, like I mentioned, um, you know, at the beginning, um, there were several improvements um, and changes for W-2 and calendar year end reporting. Um, so I'm not really going to, you know, dive deep into those um, because those are kind of in our past. Um, but we did make updates to the RITA submission um, so that that position 308, um, that R value does not repeat. Um, we also made improvements to W-2 printing. So when we initially rolled out the um, printing side, um, it was suggested that the font be increased. Um, so our developers did increase those font sizes to sort of fill that space on the form um, as best as they could. So make that print as large as possible to fill those spaces. Um, so, you know, People like me that have old eyes and struggle to see um, can actually see what's being printed. And then, as you all are aware, um, you know the menu um, W two report and submission um, menu option totally changed. So we did add the ability then to print um, from the software. So again, not going to go into that um, much further because we're we're past that point. Hopefully, everybody's probably doing a happy dance, right? <laughs> All right, uh, moving on, the um, supplemental tax option um, when it comes to employee onboarding um, will now default to none. Um, so, you know, 99.9% .9 of the times time, that's what you want that option to be anyway. So we're now defaulting that. When it comes to um, creating um, those uh, output files for W-2 um, purposes. We um, limited, when you go to the W-2 forms output files area, we put a limit on um, what is displayed in that grid um, to be two files per user. So, you know, you could see that, you know, if you're running those, creating those files multiple times until um, things are correct, then, um, you know, that grid is going to get pretty cluttered. So we actually removed um, or set a restriction to only display the last two files per user. So you can only ever have two with the same name per user. Um, and that will just help hopefully el eliminate any confusion on, you know, doing something with those files that you um, don't mean to. Um, we also improved um, the filtering and the scrolling when adding payroll items. So I don't know if you remember before, um, but it was really hard um, to add a payroll item. Um, you actually had to use the drop down um, in the scrolling option, and it, it just was kind of cumbersome. So now you can actually type in that um, that box then when you're adding um, a new uh, payroll item, you can you can enter a code, you can enter the name, you can also use the drop down box. So it just makes it easier when you're going to add those payroll items and it works, you know, more closely to other filtering um, and adding and, and searching for items, you know, that, like you're used to. When it comes to the W-2 city form, um, we added the tax entity code at the end of the file name. So, you know, you're entering a, a tax entity code when you're creating the file um, to only create records for that particular entity. So now it's, you know, adding that entity code to the end of the file. And hopefully that'll be easy, make it easier for you to determine, you know, the file, you know, if they were all named W2 City, you're going to have no way of knowing um, which file is for what. So hopefully adding that extra piece will make it easier than when you go to do something with that file. Year to date report. So we added year to date report um, more recently. Um, and we've now also added that in um, the year to date report bundles. So I have the documentation here um, pulled up. So when you close for the year or close December, you can see that the calendar year report um, bundle now includes the year to date report. Okay. So a nice feature there that um, will be helpful, hopefully, to, to users if they miss running that um, 
at, at calendar year end time. Moving on then, um, we changed the look slightly of the STRS per pay report when it comes to adjustments. So we were getting um, several reports of districts missing um, running that SERS adjustment file. So we've now changed things and I'll show you what it looks like here to hopefully stand out a little more um, so that users don't forget to um, create that adjustment file if um, you know there's a need. So we've added a note here and we've actually, you know, these are side by side now. So hopefully if they're creating the submission file, there's a button to actually create the adjustment file that are right beside each other along with a note. So fingers crossed um, that is a little more, you know, stands out a little more, makes it easier for them to, um, you know, remember to, to create that file. Okay. All right. Um, we had a report of um, from um, one of you asking how a set of W-2 files got created. Um, this, I think, was like the very beginning of, no of December. Um, it definitely was not, you know, a time when a district would be ready to generate these um, forms and reports. And it turns out, um, you know, we weren't limiting um, access um, for users. Um, maybe as you know, we didn't we didn't have that locked down as as tight as we should have. So um, we've now um, you know restricted that access. So the user actually needs to be granted um, a special permission in order to be able to see all of those W-2 report options, okay? A standard read-only user is only gonna have, um, you know, certain, certain access. They are not gonna have um, access to create forms and, and, and reports and those things, okay? They don't even have the ability to access these, uh, the W-2 archive individual and W-2 mailable forms, which is probably the way it should be, right? We don't, we don't want any, any user just to be able to, you know, randomly create those. Okay, um, the next two um, updates then were just, you know, when the federal tax tables get updated, uh, we make changes to the software, obviously, so that those, um, you know, match, um, what the IRS is is asking, um, and we also um, updated the Social Security wage um, base limit. Um, so those two got updated um, in time for um, January payrolls. Um, the um, you know wonderful feature that we had added to allow you to print the print screens um, from various um, core. Um, uh, 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 records like compensation. Um, we will continue, you know, to update those print screens to make them as he helpful as possible. Um, and one thing that was omitted and asked for um, when it comes to the compensation print screen um, is the to include the job calendar type. So we've made enhancements to that print screen option on the compensation um, record to include that in the printout. And then lastly, um, when it comes to the improvements, we were doing, um, or the developers are, are doing some preliminary work um, for W2C processing. Um, we do realize at some point that that is going to um, need to be in place. Um, there really is no, has not been a timeline given for that, um, but they are beginning to do some work um, to begin that process. Okay, um, and then lastly, in December, we had a couple new features. Um, again, going back to W-2 printing, um, you know, we've, as you're all aware, um, have the ability to generate a file then that goes out to um, the W-2 archive. Um, and this file then um, 
takes the place of that, you know, long convoluted process that had to happen um, from a third party. Um, and then that file had to be imported into um, the W2 archive so that kiosk or any other third party could access it. Um, we've made that process more simple. So um, you create the file, send it to the, the W2 archive, and then it gets, you know, placed in the right place and um, third parties like kiosk and SCView um, can access that file. Now, we did have a question, um, you know, we're not, um, you know, when it comes to the third parties, um, we ask that you have any, if you have any questions as far as what file format that file needs to be in, you know, reach out to that third party. Um, I think it was pointed out that maybe SCVU needs the XML file. You know, we we're not experts in third party um, software and how those files um, need to be formatted. So if you are working with something, you know, so another third party, um, you know, that we're not aware of, like Kiosk, SCVU, or if you have questions about what format that file needs to be in, reach out to them. And um, if you have questions, then how to create that in that file format um, in state software, we'd be happy to help you. Um, and then um, we created a new W2 output file interface. You're all familiar with that. Used it probably several times this um, uh, W2 season. So we, we don't need to dive deep into those options. And then lastly, we um, released a new option to create salary notices. Super exciting. I think it's super cool. Um, you can generate the salary notices from the new contract area or from um, the contract compensation area. So um, I'm gonna bring up, we have in the documentation under the um, configuration option, there is an option called salary notice configuration. So this, if you're gonna email the notices, this does need to be set up. So it's very similar to like the direct deposit, the email notifications, I'm sorry, for direct deposits. So we kind of step you through, um, you know, each, each field, what needs to be placed in um, each of those fields. Um, you can actually set up the email notices to go to all of the employees' email addresses or just their primary. Um, so you have control over where, you know, what email addresses those um, notices are sent to. Um, so once the configuration piece um, is in place, um, whoops, I thought I had a wrong tab, sorry. Um, we actually, again, under um, in new contract, have a section for salary notices as well. First of all, you know, it goes through the setup side of it again, um, and then steps you through um, you know, actually creating those notices. So you'll see here, um, there's a new tab um, under um, in the new contracts program called salary notices. Um, and when you um, click on that tab, it's going to ask you then for your an output file name, the statement date, how you would like those sorted, um, the school year, the contract start date, you can um, generate these for just, you know, a point by appointment type for specific employees. Um, if you'd like to just print one um, or multiple, but not all. Um, and then you can also include the district information. So, you know, super slick, super, super cool. Um, I did want to point out that, let me go back to the recap here. Um, we have had requests. So again, this is the very preliminary stages of um, salary notices. Um, we've had requests to add a couple options um, to the notices themselves, and one being having the ability to add the, un the unit amount, and then salary schedule information and years of experience. So we do have JIRA issues, and I've included those here um, for you to you know maybe watch or follow um, if you'd like. Um, and then lastly, adding lines for signatures. So, um, you know, a lot of times the um, uh, 
treasurer and then maybe the board president sign those notices so we have um, an issue to look into adding those signatures to those notices as well. Um, in the documentation, we also have all of the various fields that are currently available to be printed on the notification. So if you have a question about, you know, um, am I able to, you know, include, um, you know, years of service, you know, this list should be helpful and saying, no, we don't really, we don't have the ability to do that yet. But again, um, you know, that there is an issue for that specific, um, you know, for that, for that to be included in the future. We have um, a template here. Um, so if you want to customize the, the template, um, you can do so. Um, once you have your form, you know, in place, it's as easy as um, going then, and we kind of step you through this. I'll just scroll down instead of going. Um, if you do need to, uh, you know, if you're going to create um, a custom form, um, then you're going to go to the report manager, just like you always do. Um, maybe if you're familiar with creating um, custom direct deposit forms, you'll click create form. That's going to bring up that this pop-up, a pop-up box. And the only difference is um, from direct deposits is you're going to select in the entity type, you're going to select direct deposit. Okay, so I can show you this real quick. If I um, go to report manager and I click create form, I would enter then my um, my the name of my form. So maybe I call it custom salary notice. I can give it a description, and then the entity type. This is what we're what I was talking about that that slightly differs from direct deposit. You're going to go down and you're going to select new contract. You would browse then to find that form, and then you're going to click save. And I actually already did you know one to to test it and show you. So you can see here once that's been saved, then I have that custom salary notice available for me to use, okay? There's also, if we go to configuration and we go to that salary notice configuration, um, there's an option then to set what form um, you would like to be your default. So if I've created a custom salary notice and I, I want that to always be my default, I can change it from the default form to that custom form. Okay. And then likewise, just to show you quickly on the compensation um, record, on the contract compensations, there is um, a salary notice um, option. So I would select then my employees. And you can see once I select one, um, the salary notice um, button is available for me to, to, to click on. Okay. All right. We also did have, um, while we're, while I'm thinking about it, we did have a request recently for, to create um, salary notices for non-contract compensations. So maybe for your, your supplementals, your coaches, you know, a lot of times those are set up on a non-contract compensation. Um, and um, we are going to look into creating um, those for you or giving, give you the ability to create those. Um, keep in mind that non-contracts don't have all the pieces um, currently um, like the contracted compensations do. So, you know, if I open a non-contract compensation, you can see here there is nowhere on the screen that says contract amount. So what, what contract amount would we populate to put on the salary notice? Um, there's no, um, you know, contracted work days. So there's pieces that are missing that we assume that you would want printed on the notice. Um, so we are not ruling out, you know, not being able to print um, non-contract compensation salary notices, but we're going to have to do a little um, more um, investigating to figure out how um, that's all going to be able to work. Okay. 
All right. We will also review um, the salary notices, you know, in much more detail um, when we go through new contracts. We have a Fridays with Fiscal um, for new contracts. So we're going to um, go through all of that, you know, from beginning to end. So, you know, the very last step will be creating those um, salary notices. All right. That covers um, everything for December. Um, let's see, does, is there anything in chat? I am not the best at checking this and I apologize. Okay, good. We get a thumbs up for the salary notice. Good. I, I, I hope you find that helpful. I know we've been asked that for a long time. Okay, so now I'm going to move on to January. And again, we had um, five hot, uh, releases. We had two regular releases and then three hot fixes. Um, to start out with the bug fixes, um, we had some um, issues with W2 submission files when it comes to Rita and CCA. So we've made improvements to those. Um, one that was, you know, that, um, was brought to our attention was the way that the state code was being um, reported for out-of-state employees. So before um, this release or this enhancement was released, um, the state code of for Ohio 39 was always being used. So we corrected that. Um, so out-of-state reporting those state codes would um, populate correctly for the appropriate um, you know, state. So Indiana, Kentucky, Michigan, Pennsylvania, and West Virginia. Um, we also added the state control number for CCA. Um, we did get, we've gotten a couple questions on this. Um, my understanding is that the files for this year um, go through, you know, um, perfectly. Um, they're, the districts are getting um, information back from CCA saying that they processed their file for this year. Um, however, those state um, codes are going to have to be in place, state control numbers, excuse me, are going to have to be in place for next year. So I did reach out to Andrew Houghton. I don't know if, hopefully that name probably sounds familiar, um, because as we all know, CCA is sort of like S ERS <laughs> is and not always the easiest to um the you know decipher what exactly they're they want in that field um how it needs to be reported he did give me this long explanation and pointing me you know basically back to their um CCA file you know specifications they talk about the RS record um, and he said to follow those rules. So I think for this year, um, hopefully, you know, most of you are past that point. Um, we'll take a deeper look into um, what actually needs to be populated in that field. And hopefully we can be more helpful, you know, as it sounds like it will be required for um, 2023's um, submission. So unless somebody else has any further insight into, um, maybe information they've received from CCA and what needs to be populated in that field. Um, I read through that and my head just started spinning because it's it's so, it's a lot. <laughs> um, so yeah, so unless somebody has any comments, questions, anything additional on that, um, we'll move forward and then plan to discuss it in a little um, more detail um, when that time comes. Okay, um, moving on then, we made an update um, for an issue when um, districts were using the attendance option and then um, posting that information to current. Um, and when they were using the addition op additions options, retirement day, day counts were off. Um, and it was working perfectly um, you know, for districts until um, the last couple pays. Um, and so that was um, the developers determined what the issue was and corrected that. So now the retirement day counts will be correct 
when you're using the attendance and then post to current option. There was a slight, um, you know, moment in time when an update that was made to the Rita and CCA submission files um, actually caused a, you know, one of those null pointer ex exception errors um, and the file would not um, be generated. So we corrected that with a hot fix, you know, so that um, those files, um, you know, could get created uh, successfully and um, air free. Next then, um, there was an issue with the doc pay type. Um, and when you entered hours um, for that doc pay type, they were not being correctly reflected on the pay report, um, as well as the retirement um, reports. So you would expect when you enter, you know, a doc pay type and you enter maybe two, five, um, seven and a half, whatever it might be um, in those hours, that those be um, subtracted then from the retirement hours um, and they were not. So that was fixed. So now those um, doc hours um, will be collect correctly um, reported. And again, um, we had an issue with some changes that were made on the 6.84 release that caused that, again, another one of those null pointer exception errors um, with the absence, I'm sorry, attendance absence import option. Um, so again, um, not able to um, use that specific func functionality for a really short period of time, um, but we corrected that. So the error um, no longer happens. All right, moving right along then to improvements. Uh, we now are validating um, that local contract code um, when it comes to uh, the CC um, area um, in the EMIS entry. So we now validate that field. Um, and if it's blank um, or three characters or less, it's okay. If you put anything greater than three characters in that field, it's now going to flag an error. OK, to say that it must be three characters or less. So we had um, reports of, you know, users being able to enter um, basically whatever they wanted to in that field. And then it, when it got to the data collector, it was obviously causing errors. Um, so we've now restricted that. Um, I can show you what field that is just in case um, we're not. I'm going to get out of here. Try something. There we go. Okay, so under EMIS entry, um, under the um, EMIS contracted service tab, the local contract code, this field here, um, you, before you were able to enter more than three characters. So now if you do that, um, it's going to flag an error and saying, no, oh, sorry, you can't, can't. It can't be um, greater than three, okay? All right. Um, moving right along then, um, we actually thought that we um, updated so that doc pay types would be listed as negative values on payroll checks or, or direct deposit. Um, it was, we had reports that that was not, um, what users were seeing. Um, and it was determined that um, it just got overlooked from being included um, in the release um, that we thought it was. So you're gonna see that listed twice. So we have it up here under improvements and then we have it actually under new features. This is the same, um, same um, issue. Um, it just actually got released then um, you know, on the, the following release, okay? So you're gonna see then, um, which we've had requests for for a really long time, you know, d users get um, confused when they see, you know, I'm being docked, but it's a positive value. So now those will, will print as negatives and make it more, um, you know, understandable. 
Um, another enhancement was made to the employee onboarding um, when it comes to the compensation task. Um, so we removed the STRS advanced checkbox altogether. Um, so you're not going to see that when you're creating or reviewing um, when it comes to, you know, the employee onboarding. Um, and then when that record is actually created, you'll also see that that STRS advanced checkbox, um, you know, will appear when the record is actually created, but that box will um, remain unchecked. Okay. We had some confusion as to, you know, why it was even um, included in onboarding because it's really not relevant. So we just removed it altogether. We had requests for um, the ability to be able to use quotes um, in the CSV file um, that is being um, imported using the attendance absence import option. Um, so, you know, users wanted to be able to maybe put a description like dates um, in quotes um, and be able to successfully load that. So you now have the ability to do that. So you can use double quotes in your CSV file and it's gonna load just fine. And then lastly, in the improvements, we actually, um, it was pointed out that the um, old, if you will, um, payroll accounts view, and then the payroll accounts new view, um, that include archived option was not consistent with each other. Um, so we've actually now made the two work the same. So prior to the change, um, I've just put a note there, you know, if the position or the employee was archived, you had to select the include archived employee positions in the new grid to see everything. Um, and then in the um, old, I'm using old as in, you know, the first payroll accounts view, you had to select the include archived to see those archive positions or archived employees. Now both the views work the same. Um, so there shouldn't be any discrepancies. So they work exactly, you know, the same in both views. All right, moving on then um, to the few new features that we had. Um, we now have, and you should have all um, seen a new menu option called leaves new. Um, so if I go to my instance under core, you can now see that the existing or old view is, is still there, um, but I now have this option called leaves new. And it's just, to me, so much easier to, to look at. You know, it's in grid format. I can filter, I can sort, I can, you know, it's so much easier to use than the old view. Um, another nice feature is if you're creating um, a, a leave screen for a, a new employee. So I have an employee here. If they don't already have an existing leave um, screen, I can actually create that, okay? Um, one nice feature of using this view is I can actually add a balance. So if you have a new employee and they're you know, carrying forward um, a leave balance of any kind, I can actually put this right in this balance field and that will immediately update their balance. Um, so this is sick. So I'm just gonna put in, let's say this employee had 15 days of sick. Um, I'm gonna put in these values here. Um, let's put something here. And I'm going to click save. Save one more time. Oh, you have to enter so. The um you the hourly or daily does have to be selected for all of the leave types. So I'm just gonna put daily here. Okay, now I should be able to save it. All right, so if I go to this employee's dashboard, I can see now that that balance that I entered when I created the leave screen is automatically populated. Okay, 
So I don't have to create um, a, 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 an accumulation. That's the word I was looking for. All right. Um, I did want to point out we have we do have um, you know in red, so you don't uh, mistakenly remove it. If um, the max leave amount is removed or blank, and the accrual option is used, currently it will clear out the employee's leave balance. So please, 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 you know, keep that in mind. Um, those those leave maximums are required. So you know. Be very cautious with if you're ever touching that amount because it will if you're going to if you use the accrual option and that's blank or it's removed then it's going to clear out that employee's leave balance okay so we do have a note there um just kind of a word of caution okay and then lastly um we've actually um been you know the developers have been working on this for some time um, but we're happy to report there is a replacement for classics report sum. Um, it's kind of a mouthful, but it's called under the reports option, it's called reporting entity count summary report. Say that 10 times fast. <laughs> um, but it's, you know, it works just like classics report sum does. So you have the ability, I'll go here and show you, to um, generate a report on various um, entity, you know, days for various entities. So I, if I want a retirement count, um, I have start and end dates. And you can see um, within um, each sort of section here, there's check boxes. So if I want to generate the report for retirement days, I simply check the box and then enter my start and end date. If I want to also include ODJFS weeks, I have checked the box and then enter those um, dates as well. Likewise for EMIS days, um, just like most report options, you can select by job calendar. You can select for a specific employee if you choose to, um, if you're running it, you know, just for a specific person. And then you can also generate it for a specific pay group. Okay. Um, so. I'm going to bring up our test files are just a little wonky. So here is actually what it would look like. Um, I, I used like real um, data so I could get, you could get a better sense of what the report would look like. So I didn't include off to the left here. There's, there are two columns. Um, so you have the employee ID as well as the name. So I've just omitted that. But you can see here that because I, based on, you know, what I generated, um, asked the report to be generated for, I can see a count then of um, those retirement days as well as ODJFS weeks. Okay. Super cool. We've been asked for that for a really long time. So hopefully, you know, your districts get excited about it because um, it's, it, it is super helpful. On the recap, um, I did make a note here on um, the dates, you know, dates can be tricky. Um, so when you're running it for ODJFS weeks, you'll want to use the dates of the quarter. Um, so this follows classics, um, dating date scheme. So, you know, if users were familiar with, um, running report sum for, you know, the quarter in classic, um, they, they would have used the same dates. When it comes to like retirement days, um, you'll want to use the payroll dates. So that the st payroll start date and the payroll stop date, not pay dates. Okay. So, you know, keep those dates in mind when you're running those reports. So the first payroll start date that you want to generate the, the count for, and then the last payroll ending date that you want, um, you know, the re where you want the report to stop um, counting. So payroll dates, not pay dates. All right. Okay. All right. Um, are there any questions about anything that we talked about when it comes to 
the um, December or January release for the UCS or USPS side, sorry. I wanna touch upon, sorry, Michelle, I, I just had one other um, item that I wanted to cover since we have so many of you on today. Um, we did add a section to our documentation um, to assist with EMIS reporting um, when it comes to um, errors that you may be getting from the EMIS reports. So um, what I'm talking about is if you go to reports, EMIS reports, this is where we ask districts to start when they're thinking about their EMIS reporting. And I realized that the window for the initial, you know, just closed, um, but hopefully going forward, um, you know, and as the year progresses and then, um, you know, year end or the, the final reporting, um, this, you'll find this helpful. Um, these two reports are where the districts would want to start. So there's the EMIS, um, I'm sorry, the employee report and the position report. So this is our first attempt at um, a replacement for per debt. It's not anywhere where it needs to be. Um, you know, the developers know that, you know, we all know that, um, but it is a start. So when districts run these reports, the first thing they'll want to check is, are there errors? So you're gonna scroll all the way down to the bottom and you're going to see, yes, there's errors. However, when you look at the errors on the report, they all look the same. So again, I just kind of took a snippet from um, an instance. And you can see here, um, obviously, again, there's additional information on the report. Um, to the left, I've omitted, you know, because it was um, sensitive information. So these are the errors then that you're going to see or the error you'll see. They're all the same. Not very helpful. You know, where do I even start? It even says, you know, contact your ITC. So when a district contacts you, you know, where do you go to help them? We've put together a document um, and it's out on our wiki page. And I will show you um, if you go to SSDT meetings and trainings, we've um, added it to the section called ITC only support resources and materials. Okay, there is um, sort of a checklist here called debugging EMIS report errors. So these are the steps then that I wanted to cover with you this morning um, to hopefully clear up some help you, you know, decipher what that error means um, and get you started. So um, from the beginning, you know, if the districts run those reports and they get the error saying, you know, contact you, where do you begin? So step one, we're actually going to sort of debug these reports. Um, so to do that, you're going to go to system, monitor, logging and we're going to turn on the debugging feature okay so i'm going to show you how to do that so if i go to system i go to monitor i go to lo the logging tab and in the you know in the document it says under the name we're going to search for emis r so this emis r line here is what we want to turn on the debugging feature for. So if I double click and this does, you know, we're used to single clicking, um, you do have to double click, it opens this window here. And this drop down then allows me to select debug. So I'm going to click debug and I'm going to click save. Sorry, I'm not, I'm going to go back and forth here, but I'm going to show you here that we have it you know, outlined in these steps. So there's the logging tab, I'm typing EMISR, and then I'm gonna double click on that line, and then I'm gonna turn on the debugging feature and click save. So all of those steps are outlined here. We're then gonna rerun those EMIS reports. 
So there's the, again, the employee report and the position report. So once those have been run, then if I go to system, monitor the app log, this is going to give me more specific information about that generic error that we see on the EMIS reports. I've listed some of those um, errors that, that are possible. Um, I took a snippet of that and put that in the document as well. Um, I'm going to go back to maybe you can see this a little better. So, you know, the error says compensation hours per day is null or zero. It gives you the specific employee and then the position number. So in this case, what I would need to do is go to position 41 for this employee and I need to add hours per day to this compensation. Okay. So, um, you know, back to then our steps, I'm going to, you know, go through that list in the log, the app log, and I'm going to correct all of those um, errors that are listed. You can then rerun those EMIS reports, both the position and the employee, until they're air free. So once you have all those reports air free, um, we do want to go back then to the system monitor logging tab, and then we're going to turn off the debugging option. Um, I did ask, you know, the developers like, gosh, what if what if we forget to do that? Um, what does it hurt? It's really not harmful, um, but it it can, um, you know, your app log is going to be, you know, ginormous, um, and and you don't want that because it's logging. It's going to debug every single option, um, you know, that you are um, processing. So just remember, good rule of thumb, you know, go back in then to that logging option. Again, double click on this field here to open up that drop down, and then we're just going to make that nothing. So once it's blank, we're going to click save, and now that debugging feature is off. Okay, so again, we added this document, um, you know, to our, um, in the section that says ITC only, this, it's, it is intended for just you at the ITC. Okay, so that's why it's not in the documentation anywhere. Um, it's not intended for users to be able to, to run this. Um, this is just something to get us by um, until those errors can be, more, have more detail in them. Um, and the developers are aware of that and will work, you know, on getting those to have the detail they need to have um, in the near future. Okay, we'll go over this again um, when we talk, when we have the Fridays with Fiscal for EMIS reporting, um, but I didn't want you to have to wait until then in case there are problems that arise um, until, you know, in between. So again, you know, maybe print that off, bookmark it, whatever needs to happen, uh, but hopefully that will help clear up any confusion. Okay. All right. Now I'm done, Michelle. Are there any questions before I turn it over to Michelle? All right. Thank you everybody for your time and I hope you have a wonderful weekend. Good morning, everybody. I hope you can see my screen okay here. Um, what I'm going to do is let's do something real quick. Um, is I'm going to quickly go over um, the inventory um, information. You know, like you know, Lori and Amanda have been doing. They've been going and discussing the December release first briefly, and then um, what happened in January. So I'm back at the December recap and I am under the inventory information. And on top of inventory, I am gonna talk about ITCM too, just kind of a little brief of what's been updated in that um, new application as well these last couple of months. Um, so for the um, inventory for December, um, 
The majority of December was, as you can see, bug fixes. Um, we had um, a lot of issues with gap reporting and prior year ending balances on the gap reports not matching current year beginning balances. And so um, a lot of it had to do with transfer um, transaction information on the gap reports. Um, so I'll get to the gap reports in a little bit, but before we do that, um, just going down the list here, um, the transactions, um, we did um, make some uh, changes um, regarding bugs. Um, and one of them was um, various uh, corrections that were made to the item user interface. One of them being the category code on an item. So if I would go into a particular item, um, pick one here. Now let's say I go in and edit that item. And so one of the issues we were having is if I went in and changed the category code on that item, if this category has an asset class stored under core, categories, what happened was that you go in and change this, it would go out there then and look to see what that asset class was. And if it didn't match what was already on here um, for the asset class, it would update it. Well, we don't really want that to happen when you're actually changing an existing item. Now, if you were creating a new item, and in core categories, that category had an asset class tied to it, absolutely, you enter a new item, that asset class gets filled in automatically. But if for some reason that's been changed, transfer transactions been taking place, and now you're going in and wanting to change the category, you don't want it to automatically update that asset class. So we fixed that. And um, also with the item status, um, what was happening is if we went in and wanted to change the status of the item, and I'll just click here, go to edit, and the drop down here, um, it was not allowing us to change it to something other than active, the actual true active status. An active item is active, um, new item, excess asset called for sale, and excess asset not used. Those are considered the active items. Well, I couldn't go in and change a new item to active. Um, it wouldn't let me. Um, so we have updated that so you are able to. And you'll notice too that the disposed of status is not available. Obviously, if an item's active, you can't just go in and, and change it to disposed of. You need to create a tr uh, disposition transaction for that. Um, so we just removed that entirely so you, you don't even see it. Um, filtering on the uh, category code on the grid. And believe me, it's not just category that we're having this issue with, but if I was in, I'm gonna close out of here, or cancel out of here. And I go in and enter a particular category, item category. Before I would start entering in desk and I would get this internal error message over here in the corner. And you're probably all going, yep, I've seen that. Um, and it would have me click and then kind of start over um, to refresh my screen and um, annoying. And so we've at least, I know it's at other places on the grid still that we need to fix, but we did fix the item category. So that doesn't happen anymore. Uh, but I know there are other fields as well, columns that we need to update. Um, the transactions underneath the pending items, um, there was an issue with um, pulling them and it was rejecting some if the description exceeded the 255 characters on the or the received date was blank. So we have fixed that then um, so that it doesn't do that anymore. So those should all get pulled in correctly. Um, gap reports, like I said, we did have um, a lot of things we had to fix based off of just some transfer issues that were going on. So these are, I'm not going to go through these in detail, um, but you can see that I've listed out the actual gap report and what the problem was and what, it, what was done to correct it. So I tried to take um, the release notes and just kind of pare them down a little bit and just more of a summarize of exactly what was going on with those. Um, so you can read those, you know, um, later, but these are the actual gap changes that were made. Um, 
So a lot of those were preventing those or changing those beginning balance amounts or, you know, the transfer amount was getting in inflated or it wasn't being included. So again, those were all fixed in December. Um, miscellaneous, um, I just added kind of like a miscellaneous section, uh, depreciation for future disposed of items that were not being calculated when a fiscal, fiscal year prior to this disposal was closed. So um, what was happening here is that if I went in and disposed of an item in fiscal year 23, but 22 was still open. So if I closed 22 then, um, the depreciation um, didn't update for that item. So it should have because it was still an active item at the end of 22. So we fixed that. And again, that was causing balancing issues with ending and beginning balances. So that was fixed. Um, the disposition migration importer, we're, we're done with migrations, um, but um, it was, there were, we have an issue where it was trying to create a disposition for an item that didn't exist. And there was an error and it kept trying to, to create that. Um, and it shouldn't because the item doesn't exist. Um, so now that we're done with migrations, we did get it fixed, but something we don't have to worry about anymore. It was preventing, um, you know, those items, it was um, causing issues. Um, so that's why we, we had to get that fixed at the end of the year. The disposition importer, meaning the system dispositions um, underneath the system, if you're doing imports uh, for disposed of assets, uh, we were having issues with that too. Um, it's been corrected to properly handle a CSV file that excludes air adjustments and authorized by fields. Those two fields aren't required when you're importing disposition transactions. Wasn't allowing people to post uh, disposition transactions through the system import option uh, because it was wanting those two fields. They're not required, so we fixed it. So you don't have to put something in those fields anymore. Under system uh, configuration jobs. Um, so that's something that um, you guys may see, um, the, the districts could see as well. Um, if you generate the report bundle, you can go out there and see the status of that bundle. Is it running? Has it completed? Has it failed? Um, we, we had fixed some issues back in December, but I think some of that may be rearing its ugly head again because we are having some tickets come in regarding failed um, bundles um, and the job scheduler um, is not reporting those completely yet. So um, developers are aware of this. So we did make an attempt here in December to fix some of that, but I think we need to look at that again to see what's going on. Um, we really truly think for those of you that are like, yeah, I got a ticket in for that, um, that it's related to the audit report maybe. Um, because the audit report can be huge, um, especially it's running for a full year and it may never complete. Well, if the audit report is part of that inventory report bundle, the audit report isn't completing, that report bundle may not complete as well. And so it may just kind of not do anything. And then you're going out there in the job schedule saying, you know, it's still running and now it's gone. You know, it never said it failed. It never said it completed. So we are very much aware of this. Um, developers are looking into the auto report and making improvements on that. Um, and that is scheduled for release. So hoping to get that fixed. Uh, one thing that you can do right now, work around, is generate the reports uh, manually for the report bundle if they're needing them. Um, otherwise, um, you know, wait till this gets fixed and then generate that report bundle then. Um, so that's kind of what's going on with all of that and, um, and the whole report bundle situation going on right now. Um, another update that we did back in December was um, entity ID and the date range parameters um, were not working correctly when you're running the asset listing by grant report. So, um, so it wasn't allowing that to generate correctly. So we fixed that as well. And one other thing is um, improvements. We did um, in, um, add some subtotaling onto the brief asset listing and the asset list by report. So it depends on your sort option that you select. So 
So if I go in here and go to the brief asset listing, and down here I've got the sort options, and I sort by fund, you know, and it's going to subtotal then by fund. So those are the things that we've added and enhanced. So not only does it sort, it will subtotal by that option as well. So those were some of the things that we um, did in December. And also with that, any questions before I move on to ITCM? Um, we also released, we still had it in beta um, in December. So um, December 14th, we had version uh, 0.6, where we added still a lot of features onto this because things weren't, you know, we're still working on getting the application up and going. And so this just describes some of the stuff that we did. Um, and uh, what I'll do is once we talk about 1.0 um, in January, I'll show you the application a little bit more and what was added. Um, but these were just the things that we did in December. And also, again, you can always click on the actual link to the version and review this information there. So that was inventory and ITCM in a nutshell here in December. What I'm gonna do is I'm gonna go back and move on to G23. In January, and I'll go down to the inventory releases. So again, we had some bug fixes. Um, a few of them had to do with GAP, um, and then we had other ones throughout the application that we had to um, fix. Uh, the first one being um, transactions underneath the items when splitting an item. Um, if that original item is no longer capitalized because you split it, so the amount is underneath that capitalization threshold, it wasn't re uh, updating the capitalization flag um, correctly. Um, you could go in and refresh it and then it would show. Um, so we fixed that then so it shows right away. You know, if you go in and split an item that had 10, uh, a quantity of 10 out into 10 different separate uh, tags, and now it's below the threshold, obviously, once you complete that split, that item should no longer show capitalized. So, um, so that does update automatically now. Transfers, um, we updated the transfer UI to allow processing transfers for all statuses. Um, considered active, which I talked about before, active, new item, and then the excess um, statuses, those are all considered active. Um, so before it only allowed you to do a transfer just for the actual active status. Um, so we've updated that now. So now if you have an item that's a new item status, you can create a transfer for that. We also enforce transfers if you need to delete a transfer that you did this year, that you have to do them in order of the transaction. So if I did um, three transfers this year, I can't go in and just delete one from four months ago if I've done one since then. I have to delete them in order. Um, I believe that's how um, Classic worked that way, um, and it probably has to do with the calculations and how it reflects. Um, so we have restricted that. Uh, gap reports uh, causing balancing issues again um, with some of these. So we've made some updates. Um, the acquisition amounts on the fixed asset by source and the schedule of change in fixed assets um, should no longer include those payment type transactions. Those shouldn't be included on there. Um, so they were. And so that was inflating amounts. So we fixed that to exclude them. And also included in this change uh, was another update to the beginning balance values. Um, the beginning balance would display as a zero if an item did not have an acquisition transaction. Uh, well, if that item was from you know, the prior year and you know, and you close the year, should be the beginning balance. Doesn't matter um if that you know if there might not be an acquisition tied to it for some reason if it was you know migrated over that way um so we've changed that now so that it you know shows that uh, original cost as the beginning balance for that year 
Um, otherwise, you know, it's not going to show up correctly on those beginning balances on your gap reports are going to be less. So we made sure to get that fixed as well. Um, some miscellaneous um, things that we've done is underneath uh, the user interface, um, we corrected um, to properly display any validation errors oh, and remain in the edit mode. So this was in various areas. You'd go in and try to edit something. You make a change and it reverted back. Um, and you had to go in and, and click on edit again. So it was just some minor annoyances that were happening. Um, that we fixed. And with depreciation, we fixed the depreciation of an item um, disposed of in a fiscal year that had been reopened. So I've got an example here of what that means. So basically, if I reopen and I if I reopen fiscal year 22, so I'm in 23, I reopen 22, I dispose of an item in 22, I reclose 22, the depreciation transactions that were created when I originally closed 22 has been removed. And that shouldn't be. It was, you know, um, it was, you know, actually, you know, an active item at that point. So um, we've updated that to fix that. Um, with that, too, we had a patch. Um, that it was airing out when you were encountered a disposition with an empty date. So we've you know had that overlooked that now so that it's okay to have that empty date and um, it'll still allow you to um, it'll still show that disposition. So um, improvements that we made, uh, we did create a user listing report. So underneath, go back to my list of reports, there is now a user listing. And this is similar to USAS and payrolls user listing report, where I can go in and select maybe a specific role, or do I just want active versus um, inactive users? And we generated a PDF and a text file auditors like the text re report format, uh, but those are both available. And here is what that actual user listing looks like. Um, so very similar to what you see with USAS and payroll. So I know that's something that the auditors have been asking about. So we got that report out there. And also um, we um, creating an air now um, when creating a new item. So what was happening is if I go in and I go into create a new tag, it was allowing me to continue on. Um, you know, it checks to see you have a tag number and you're filling out the information here. It checks that the, you know, the date is in an open period, but what it wasn't checking is to see if there was an amount. Um, so this has now been enforced. So when you go to create an item, you have to put the amount in here before you can move on to continue item and fill in the rest of the information. Obviously, the amount that gets entered in here is going to be populated then as the original cost when you get to that next screen. Um, so we just enforced that. Now, we were having problems with people going in and they skipped this part. And when they got into the item, they entered the original cost in there. And depending how they got out of the item, added it, maybe went in right after they posted the item and edited it, it, up, it uh, doubled the original cost. Um, so it was inflating amounts on reports and obviously inflating amounts on that actual item. Um, so we fixed that now so that they have to put an amount in here. And those were the updates that were done in January. Um, so again, you know, December, we had a lot of, with a couple of regular, hot, uh, regular um, you know, releases and some hot fixes in January. It slowed down a little bit where we just had a couple of regular releases and one hot fix. We were busy though with the ITCM um, and because people were starting to use it. Um, so um, we did have uh, some regular and some hot fixes. So 
Um, obviously, 1.00 was our first official, you know, release, regular release. And so um, then we we did, you know, people were using it. We had a hot fix that needed to go out a couple times here, a few times here. And then we had another regular release and another hot fix. So I, you know, we're past that, you know, January's over with 1099 W2 submissions. So I think, you know, we're, we're good with where things are right now. Um, but these were just some of the things that we updated in here. You know, like I said, we did have some bug fixes and some of them regarding the W2 merge. Um, so we fixed those. Another thing that we were having an issue with, and we put out a message to you guys, was the amounts were showing as inflated on the grids. So if I looked at the 1099 after I merged it, I saw this, you know, 300 million um, figure, but it really should have been 3 million or something like that. Um, so it wasn't included on the submission files. So we were glad about that. It, but it was showing on the actual grid when you view the grid and it showed that inflated figure. It's like it moved the decimal over to the right a couple um, spaces. Um, and also, if you wanted to extract the results for a spreadsheet, you know, to keep on hand, um, it showed those inflated figures in there as well. So we got that fixed ASAP. Um, but, you know, we were relieved that the submissions were okay on that one. Um, some of the improvements that we made, uh, one thing is the combined federal and state. So I'm just going to go into ITCM. This is what it looks like. Some of those things that we did in December, you know, we put the logo up here. We added user option and a monitor option, um, but that Combined federal state, um, we did not have that option in there yet as of December. We added that in January because obviously that's needed uh, for you ITCs that were submitting on behalf of your districts to say that you were approved for that. So we added that so you could mark that. So it was on the submission file. Um, so that was one of the um, improvements that we made. Um, also, um, we moved the lower constraints on the ODGFS to allow zero to 14 characters. So something that was pointed out to us, um, just did some typo changes that we had on the grid um, and the default year parameter for merging. Um, W2s and the 1099s default to the, you should default to the previous calendar year date um, based on the system date. So we made sure that we fix that as well. Um, so all of that information is now up to date and working properly. Um, so one other thing too we did was we did add um, the W2 city option in there. We didn't have that in there. So if I go back, so we had the W2 merge, but we added the W2 city as well. So I know that a couple of you have asked about you know, even more enhancements for next year. And I know one of them, just because I remember this ticket, um, they were asking about doing, um, they submitted the data to, to the IRS already. Um, and now they realize they missed a few vendors for like the 1099s. Um, how do we get that in there? Um, so right now you kind of have to clear out what's already been merged um, and then go in and create a new file for just those ones that were missed and submit that additional one. Um, so those are things we still need to iron out and see if there is a way that we can do that in here for next year. So, you know, if you guys have any things, if, anything that you encountered for those ITCs that did use this application, um, send a, create a ticket to us uh, with any questions that you have regarding that. Um, so, you know, this is something that, you know, we can always add talk to the developers about this. And if it's something that, you know, seems like it needs to be added in there, we'll create a zero issue for it to get it taken care of uh, for the next year. Okay. Well, I think that wraps up um, what we had for ITCM and inventory for January. Um, one other thing I, I kind of wanted to point out to you guys again, and I know that Amanda and Lori were in here earlier, is our schedule of um, training sessions for the new year. And I did happen to see a ticket that just came through. I'm going to pick on you, Heidi. 
um, wanting to change the date on a couple of these. So um, yes, I, I see, I think you had said that you wanted to change the um, EMS session um, with the contract, new contracts and salary notices. You wanted to flip-flop those. Um, so yes, we'll look into that and, and get those because you, you know, you've got districts that are probably going to start on that sooner rather than later for new contracts. Um, so yes, we'll get those um, flipped for you guys um, so that the new contract and salary notices will go in April and then the EMIS uh, reporting errors will be in May. Um, you know, we're trying to get the EMIS ones out there um, just to give you guys time to kind of digest that stuff before, you know, the final period, staff reporting period in June. Um, but that should still give you guys enough time and stuff. So, um, and that's one thing that Lori just touched, touched upon that we will definitely go through again is how to debug some of those EMIS errors. Um, but yes, everything's out here. So everything should be working. Um, so you just want to make sure when you register for these to put in the correct um, address, your email address, so you get emailed the registration details. I do get notified if that didn't go through. And so what I do is, you know, I get an email message saying, you know, this one did not go to the specific ITC person. So I just take that then and I just forward it on to you. It's only happened a couple of times. Um, and it's because the email address wasn't correct. And that's easy to do when you register, hit your, you know, a typo in your email um, address. So I'll make sure that you guys get those that maybe didn't go through. Or if you're thinking, huh, I never got an email about that session, you may want to register again. So, um, so that's where all these links are at. And just to um, talk about what's coming up here, like Amanda said, we're kicking off our training season here. And so um, we've got a, refund, a review of the refund options and payroll is going to be our next uh, session next week. And then we're going to be doing budgeting in February. And then in March, just I wanted to point out, this is when we're doing our overview sessions. And I sent you guys that long email um, explaining all of this. But yeah, we're handling it differently this year. You know, we're going to be going through processes. Um, so it makes more sense than just going down through a, a menu option and just covering each of the options in each menu. We want to show you how it's affected in the process. <laughs> so we're going to start with payroll and basically, and so a lot of that gets touched upon, you know, when you're preparing for payroll, you're going into core you're, and you're going into some of those options. Um, so we just want it, we feel like it's going to make more sense watching it, how it's being used. Um, instead of just identifying what's in a menu option. So, um, and also with that too, we don't want to make them so long. We were doing three hour sessions for three days, you know, a piece. That's a lot. That's a lot to ask of you guys to sit there and listen for three hours um, when we felt like this could really change it to where we might, you know, some of these, it depends, um, but maybe preparing for payroll is going to take maybe an hour and a half. And the payroll process may take less or more. So it just it just depends. But we're hoping to keep each of these sessions at one and a half hours, maybe two if we need to, um, instead of drawing, drawing them out for three hours a day. Um, so that's kind of uh, the way we're handling it this year. Like I said, payroll is prepping for it, going through the payroll process, and then what you do after the payroll process. Um, and then for USAS, it's managing accounts, doing the expenditure process and the receipt process, which covers a lot of the reports and stuff like that that are involved in those processes. So instead of just going through a report menu, we're gonna show you the reports as we encounter that step in the process. Um, so that's basically what we're doing there. And then we'll give you guys a little bit of a breather. And then in April, we'll go through inventory and we'll talk about that. I know that the survey results we had a lot of, and it was funny, you guys cracked me up, inventory for dummies and stuff like that, um, some comments that were made. And so I know a lot of you are new to inventory in general. You didn't know classic. Um, so, you know, you, um, and you don't know um, the redesign yet, and I get it. So um, we're going to go through some of that stuff in detail and take you through 
processing in there so you're more comfortable so you can help your districts. Um, any questions about our training schedule that we have here? Okay. Well, I thank you guys for hanging on today. I know it was a little bit longer because we were doing both, but um, next month we'll just be doing the recap for February. So, um, but I appreciate um, your time and I hope you guys all have a wonderful weekend. So take care everyone.